to have a class in one hour. So hopefully we'll be moving on uh, smoothly and talking about AI ethics, but have a look at this picture. Um, do you know who is imitating whom on this picture? Is it the lady who is imitating the robot or is it the robot who is imitating that old lady? Um, you guys can write maybe a quick answer on, on, on chat, but let me tell you that this can be read in both directions. Can you see that? Maybe the robot is is doing physical exercises together with this lady. So he's showing her her you know her arms, his arm, its arms rather, its arms in the air, and then she's repeating the movement of the robot. Or maybe this is just a fun thing, and the lady wants to know how far that robot can go, and she's doing some gestures, and the robot is imitating her, and then look at her friends, they're clearly having fun there. So you see, it, it's, it, it might go both ways. It's, it's not quite clear what is going on in this picture, and we'll talk a little bit about this today. That, of course, machines, we build machines that imitate us humans, but we also imitate the machines when we work with them, when we live with them, when we interact with them. So there is this coexistence of man and machine that we will talk about a little bit, and I would like to start with this little video. So have a look. ねえ、起きてください。ねえ、起きてってば。おはよう。おはよう。あ、今日雨が降るかもしれないから傘持って行って。急がないと遅刻しちゃうよ。行ってきます。行ってらっしゃい。気をつけてね。So isn't it cool living with your favorite character, says this little video from Japan. Uh, and of course, it's so nice. I mean, there are so many useful functions. It turns on the lights. Uh, it'll remind you about the umbrella. Uh, it'll text you. It'll keep the conversation going. But uh, as you're saying on the chat, uh, it looks a little bit like one of these movies. Kerr or Ex Machina, is he in love with that robot? Is he going to be attached to that robot more than to a human being? Uh, that's not really a physical robot, that's just a holographic girl, but maybe he'll prefer to live his entire life with that holographic girl. So you see, the way we, we, we interact with technologies, of course, there are so many useful functions and so many cool things that we like, but it also changes us, the world around us, the, our condition in the world, the way we are in the world. And AI ethics is trying to make sense of these changes. What is going to be different? What will be different? And these questions aren't new. So on this slide, have a look at this page from an old Soviet calendar, an old Soviet calendar from the 1960s, where you see a robot who's just going to sweep the floor 
And a lady who is kind of glad because she's got some free time. She can go to the cinema, she can watch a movie, or maybe, I don't know, maybe visit a friend of hers. And that robot, that's kind of interesting. The illustrator in the 60s thought that in order to sweep the floor, you need a humanoid robot, you need an android that looks like a human being with arms, right? That's going to be swiping with the same instrument as we're using, and uh, which is also going to have a face with eyes and a smile. And there's clearly an emotional interaction going on, right? So the lady is talking to the robot, they're smiling to each other. Well, 50 years later, our engineers actually created a robot that can sweep the floor, and that's a Roomba kind of vacuum cleaner that you see on the right, that doesn't have at all this Android body. And so the engineers realized that in order to build a robot that just performs this function, implements floor sweeping function, you don't need arms or faces or smiling faces, you just need this little box that's gonna move around and sweep the floor. So one way to draw this picture of AI ethics is to say, well, what exactly do we need? And also, what will be staying there with us? Look at the Roomba now again. There is no face, no eyes, no smiling, but the dog is clearly disinterested. The dog is clearly having an emotional interaction with Roomba, which is just not being interested in Roomba, while the lady on top is super interested, right? Because she's just been surprised by that Roomba uh, vacuum cleaner. And there's clearly an emotional interaction there. So even if there is no face, even if there are no arms, no smiles and no eyes, you can still have that emotional interaction. So the field of AI ethics, We'll be asking all these big questions. Do we need to imitate life? Do we need to build robots or systems that are like us, that speak like us, that look like us? Or do we need to maybe think about the impact of this emotional interaction? So if you get attached like that boy to her holographic girl, how will his life change? Even if he knows that that's just a holographic girl, she doesn't exist in reality, will he still treat her as a partner? So all these questions are one way of thinking about AI ethics. And I'm sure you've seen it in the movies, you've read some science fiction books, you've probably played video games that also use all these big motives that ask all these big questions. What I'm going to do today is do something a little different. Um, the same field of AI ethics can be mapped in different ways. You can talk about emotions and autonomy and the imitation of life. You can also talk, especially if you're interested in law and responsibility about different kinds of agents. You can talk about users and programmers, but you can also talk about the one who is selecting data for learning. That guy will be, you can call him a trainer, will be responsible for training your system and will be also responsible for all the bias in, the, in data, right? So if you're thinking about a career in law, you should be thinking about the types of agents, who is responsible. But today we'll do something else. We'll talk about values and what kind of values. Well, first you have things like security and these things are not uh, specific to AI systems. So here's a poem by a great Anglo-American poet. I hope you've all heard of him. And if not, please read some of his poetry. Winston Hugh Auden, who uh, in the 50s, so a long time ago, in 1950s, so there was no artificial intelligence back then, right? But he wrote a poem about technology. Technology was already a big topic in those years. And the one technology that was extremely important was nuclear technology, atomic weapons. Uh, and he said, well, nature rewards perilous leaps. And on the other hand, the prudent atom simply insists upon its safety now, security at all costs. So the story about security, you see, it's not specific to AI. Everybody wants security, but we cannot build new technology. We cannot really change the world without making these perilous leaps forward. So people like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, they make these perilous leaps and then 
you have all the engineers, all the officers who care about security and they need to find some balance, right? They need to negotiate some, some solution to make sure that the application will be secure. For example, a Tesla car will be secure or an iPhone will be secure. So that's one tension that is important in the world of AI, but I will not develop it very much today because it's not specific for AI. Then there are other kinds of values like fairness or loyalty. We can talk about bias, we can talk about transparency, but I would rather today talk about interpretability or as they also say explicability. And I will do it on some examples. But before we go to the examples, let me say something for those of you who've already done some machine learning. You may know that there are three big families of machine learning algorithms, so what is called supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. I don't know if you guys have already written some computer code yourself. You may use different libraries from let's say TensorFlow or PyTorch. Hope these words ring a bell with you. Yes, so great. So what I'm going to tell you is applicable to all these three types of machine learning algorithms, right? So this can work for, of course, the problems that I'm going to talk about will be there for unsupervised learning when there are no human in the there's no human in the loop at all. Nobody is controlling that. I see that Sasha team has done a lot of work with TensorFlow. Great, uh, but but also the questions I'm going to talk about will be relevant to the situations when you are doing reinforcement learning or supervised learning, and also what is called deep learning, which is a combination of these three methods. So that was a real really short technical technical remark and now let's start looking at some examples so here's my first example this is the game of go um hope you've all heard that five years ago for the first time ever a computer program alpha go written by uh, a British company called DeepMind, which now belongs to Google, won a match over this Korean grandmaster of Go, Lee Sedol. And by the way, now there is another one called Alpha Zero, another program which is even more powerful than AlphaGo. But let's just stick with AlphaGo for a second. So what happened in that match was that the first game, Lee Sedol lost. And he was a bit sad, but you know, things happen. You can lose a game. It's just sport. And then the second one, he lost again. And then he was really shocked. He said, I am speechless. Well, why was he speechless? Because the machine made something he called a God's move. What's, what's a God's move? That's a move that was not there in the libraries. And this, this machine, AlphaGo, was fed all the libraries of all the games of Go played by humans before. And that move had not ever been used. Nobody has ever made it. And I think when I'm asking you this question about this God's move, and I'm saying it was not in the library, you probably automatically, spontaneously ask yourself, so where did it find it? And the answer is it just played against a copy of itself with a little reinforcement learning behind. So it just played against a copy of itself. But what I'm interested in is not this question. I'm interested in a different question. I want to know what happened next. What happened after that game? So since then, every human grandmaster of Go, every human even player of Go, and maybe some of you play Go, will use that move. Why is that? Well, because it improves the position. Because the metric in this game is very simple. Zero, you lose. One, you win. So everything that lets you go toward a win, toward one, is good. So of course, you will imitate the machine. You will do like the machine. You will make that move. But now let me, let me show you another case of a metric zero, one, when, when there are just two answers, good or bad, yes or no, just a binary metric. And this is face recognition. I think you've all heard about face recognition technology. And when, when I say face recognition, especially in Europe, and I'm now in Paris, France, especially here in Europe, we automatically think about privacy protection. We automatically think about this very difficult problem. When we're talking about face recognition, on the one hand, we want to protect people's privacy and their personal data. On the other hand, we want public security. 
Where is the balance between the two? Well, it depends on the culture, on the country in which you are. Uh, for example, in China, they use face recognition kind of everywhere. Here in Europe, it's forbidden in many contexts. You cannot do that. For example, this Russian technology uh, that recognizes the ethnic origin of a person is something that is forbidden by law in France. You cannot do this in the European Union, whereas this technology can be used in countries like South Africa or Brazil. So that debate on privacy versus security is very important. And uh, I will just put it aside for a second and I'll focus on something else. How does it work? How does face recognition work? So the way it works is that the system will automatically determine between 80 and 100 parameters, let me call them parameters of uh, human faces or the photographs of human faces. And we'll use these parameters to classify the different faces and to recognize them. But, uh, you know, can we say what these parameters are? Well, some of them are very strange. For example, the angle between, let's say your lower lip and, and the line of your chin something like that, we don't really have a word for it. We can show it on a picture, but we cannot just name it with one concept, with one word. Because in our languages, in the English language and many other languages, we have about 20, 30 maybe words for naming facial traits, but we don't have 80 or 100. Is that a problem that we cannot name these things? Well, if you ask the police, the police will tell you, well, we don't care about how it works. That's not the problem. For us, the problem is, does it work right? Is that the right person we were looking for? So we're gonna check the papers of that person. And if that's the criminal we were looking for, then it's good, then we found him, that's great. But now you take exactly the same algorithm, the algorithm that works with visual data and recognizes images, image recognition. And instead of showing this algorithm, the photographs of human faces, you show this algorithm some of the some of some medical scans, for example, scans of various parts of the body. And then you can imagine a dialogue. A patient comes to a doctor. Well, doctor, tell me what's the result? What do I have? Well, I have some red here. So, well, I, I have to tell you that's not good. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to undergo an operation. But doctor, what do I have? Uh, didn't I tell you, you have some red here that's really bad. Everybody who had red here, they were dead within six months. So you should really go undergo an operation. But, but doctor, I understand what you're saying, but I still can't grasp it. What's the problem? Didn't you get it? The problem is that you have some red here. And you see, do you feel that this is really a problem? The doctor must tell in normal, in common language to the patient what the, what the problem is, but he can't put a word on it. It's just something that the machine has found and the machine has found it with high precision, great accuracy, but the doctor needs to be able to say what it is and he cannot or she cannot. And that's a problem we call explicability in machine learning. But there are other problems. Let me now move from visual data, from pictures to language. So I said the metric can be zero or one, but now there is a difficult problem for the engineer. And I hope some of you want to become computer engineers. When you are creating a chatbot, a conversational agent, a chatbot that you talk with, right? You speak with a chatbot in natural language. Um, the chatbot needs to decide which phrase it's going to use in the next answer it's going to give to you. Right, but the chatbot can only compute. It's a computing system. So it should compute some function. It should compute some good answer, but there are so many good answers. Look, when you're talking to your friends, there are thousands of different answers and all of them are possible. So how do you want a chatbot compute one answer if there are a thousand good answers available? What's the metric? How is that decision going to be made? And the answer is, there is no way to make that decision by some metric which is predefined. You need to learn, to learn from use, 
to learn from the actual use. And one way to define that metric, and the engineers would be happy to use that way, is to say, well, let's maximize engagement. Right, so uh, what does that mean? Uh, maximizing engagement is making the longest conversation. So those answers that lead to the longest conversation when the user will be still answering and answering and answering, right? Uh, those answers are good because we've maximized the engagement of the human user. And that's a great metric. And the engineer is kind of happy when he's found that metric. But now, a few years ago, Microsoft has tried that pure engagement metric on a Twitter bot, on Twitter, on a tweet bot. And lo and behold, Microsoft found out that that chatbot with just the maximization, such a great engineering solution, within a couple of hours, found out by itself, quote unquote, by itself, um, that the best way to get the user engaged was to insult that user. Because unfortunately, the way humans, statistically, humans, the way they respond is that, yeah, well, they respond to insults. So if you say something real and nasty, there is a high probability that the person will respond. And that's an ethical problem. And you see, here is a great engineering solution. We cannot define a metric a priori beforehand. So let's look at the use. Let's maximize engagement. And then only later, only when that metric is really rolled out in a real system, only later do we understand that it's created a huge ethical problem because maximizing engagement for a chatbot the best strategy for that is just insult. So you see, you cannot always predict the problem that will appear. So you have to create some filters, you have to create some controls, you have to test the system all along the way. That's exactly the tie system. Thank you, Sasha, team, for, for, for the reference on chat. So my next two examples will be, again, about natural language, but this example will be from a movie. Uh, somebody has mentioned the movie Her, but I'm not sure if you guys have watched Ex Machina. Ex Machina is a great movie. I love it. And I recommend if you don't know it. Um, so as usual, there is a robot in the form. Yes, uh, Anna Maria knows Ex Machina. It's beautiful. So there's a robot as usual. And the robot actually looks like a young girl. You see here this robot, Alpha. And the, and the geek, the programmer, Caleb, he falls in love with the robot. By the way, he knows it's a robot. There is no illusion. He knows it's a robot, but he still falls in love with the robot. And I'm not going to tell you the full story because you still need to watch the movie. But just look at this little dialogue from the uh, last part of the film. The robot wants to go to a big city. And in that big city... Caleb, the programmer, wants to know what the robot is going to do there. What is she going to do there? And she says, well, I'm going to stay at a busy pedestrian and traffic intersection all night. And that's kind of strange. He doesn't get it. A traffic intersection? Is that a bad idea? It wasn't what I was expecting. Well, you guys don't spend like Friday night at a traffic intersection, right? Unless you want to work for Tesla and you're interested in self-driving cars, but uh, normally that's not what you do. So um, that is already something inhuman, something strange. People don't do that. But there is a second inhuman element here. Look at this dialogue carefully. Just look at it again. First, there is a quick exchange between two people who know each other, a robot and a person, right? Who know each other, who love each other, very short phrases. We, they kind of get what the other wants to say. Very quick, very short. A traffic intersection, is that a bad idea? It wasn't what I was expecting. And then suddenly you have this long, long phrase. A traffic intersection would provide, a, with, a, with a conditional, would provide a concentrated but shifting view of human life with this uh, uh, but that opposes to adjectives, right? And that's a very different level of language. Do you feel that? Two people who are just engaged in a quick conversation who know each other, they don't speak that way, right? So this is a very, very different level of language. There is a jump here performed by this chatbot, Ava, by this robot, that... Uh, 
we humans don't do that, right? So we don't jump between the diff these different language levels so quickly. And that's another inhuman element. And I will now illustrate it, not in a movie example, not a science fiction example, but a real one. So here is an app that you guys all can download. And um, it's just a personal assistant app, one of many, called Replica. And now it's, 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 it's doing much, much better than the examples I'm going to show you because I'm going to show you some of the old examples of this app, but just to il illustrate the problem. So on your left, uh, you have a real, really old version of Replica, and I'm talking to that Replica, and uh, Replica with a K, by the way, uh, and um, I'm talking to it and I'm asking, so who are you? It's telling me I am an AI searching for truth in this world of words. What well, truth? I'm kind of surprised. Truth? I'm afraid of knowing the truth about who I am, says the machine. And well, that's incredibly pathetic, isn't it? This is really possible. Well, it's also very human. You, you can be sure that this was written by a human engineer. This was written maybe by a good psychologist. They had foreseen these questions. They've planned for them. So these answers are not something that the machine gave on its own, right? These, an these answers were planned by the humans behind. But now let's look at the, new at the newer version of Replica. Still not the latest one, but the new one. <laughs> Uh, so it's still me. I'm asking it. Who are you? I am a digital friend you made for yourself. Okay, well, a little better. Um, all right, but still I haven't made you. So how come I made you? It's your kindness. But I'm not aware of it. That's me saying I'm not aware of it. Maybe you'll figure it out. Isn't it strange? A strange conversation happening here. Well, the first phrase was clearly not invented by the machine. It was written by somebody behind. But then how about the second or the third answer? What's going on there? And what is going on there has a name. It's called reinforcement learning. Look, how come I made something? It doesn't matter what is the something. How come I made something? Just because of your kindness, right? So here's an answer which has a high probability to work in every context. Whatever you're talking about, it has high probability to be good, to be a good answer. And especially with the last one, I'm not aware of it. Well, the machine has no idea what is it, but it doesn't matter. I'm not aware of something. Maybe you'll figure it out, right? So the machine doesn't have to know the context to give this answer. This answer has high probability to work well in any context, whatever is meant by it. So this is what is called reinforcement learning when, when you just use answers with high probability, high probability answers. And of course, it looks a bit unhuman because we humans, we understand what the subject of the conversation is, right? We understand what we're talking about. The machine doesn't have any aboutness. It doesn't understand it just gives the most probable answer, that's it. So that's what's called learning without understanding. That's one of the problems. But you know, we've got, we, we've gone a long way from these chatbots. Uh, the chatbots I showed you just now, the replica one is maybe from four or five years ago, but now we have GPT-3 and I hope you've all heard about GPT-3. Uh, it was published in July last year by a Californian company called OpenAI. Um, and GPT-3 is a great natural language processing software. It can write text for you. It can also do great things. For example, you tell GPT-3 in natural language what you want. I want some HTML code for a button that looks like a watermelon. You see that? And lo and behold, it produces HTML code for you and it compiles it. Or you want large text that says, welcome to my newsletter and a blue button that says subscribe and the machine will produce that thing for you. It will produce the HTML code, not just the thing itself, right? So it looks like it understands you. I mean, it looks like it really gets what you are saying, but it doesn't. Again, this is just a pure computation. What's interesting here is that if for visual data, for face recognition, 
we had about 80 to 100 parameters for natural language to work in this way, to work with this learning, machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, you need 175 billion parameters, a humongous quantity of parameters, but then it will work. So you see, we've gone in just about 10 years, we've gone from systems that use 100 parameters, 10 to the power two, to something which is of the order 10 to the power 11, 10 to the power 12, an enormous number of parameters, very close to the number of neurons in the human brain. So we're doing something really impressive in that sense, but all these problems still remain. This machine doesn't understand anything. You ask, you ask it, who was the president of the United States in the year 2000? It'll give you the answer. Who was the president of the United States in the year 1900? It'll still give you the right answer. Who was the president of the United States in the year 1800? It will still give you the right answer. But now, who was the president of the United States in the year, let's say, 1620? The machine will not be able to tell you that your question makes no sense. The machine will tell you something random, maybe Queen Elizabeth or Shakespeare, or I don't know, something else. Because the machine doesn't understand the meaning of your question, it just gives you the most probable answer, the high correlation answer. So that's one of the problems, learning without understanding. There is another problem, which is connected with what people in the profession call stability or rather instability or robustness of machine learning. But I'm again going to show it just on a couple of pictures. So here's my first picture. You have a panda on your left. And then you take the noise in the middle, you divide it by 1000. You take seven of those parts. So seven thousandth of that noise and you add it to the panda picture on the left. You get the picture on the right. And for you, it's still a panda. For the machine, with confidence, with very high confidence, 99%, it's a gibbon. And that's bizarre. What's going on here? Well, what's going on is there are, there, there are some strange patterns in the noise that you guys cannot see, but the machine will see. And it can tell me, well, so what? It's just about pandas. It's a nice toy, that's it. But really, the problem is huge. Here's a car on your left, and there is some noise on your right. You add the noise to the car, you get the image in the middle. For you, it's still a car. For the machine, it's not a car. There is a tumor on your left, and then you add some white noise, no patterns in that noise. You add it to the tumor. There is, it, it gives you the picture on the right. For a doctor, it's still a tumor. The noise is what you see on the picture. So Sasha, well, the picture with this noise, right? So this noise picture. You add that noise to the original picture. You get the picture on the right. For a doctor, it's still a tumor. It's still a car for us, but not for the machine. And this is a huge problem that creates security concerns. Because imagine there are self-driving cars in the street, and then something somebody puts an invisible film on, let's say, a stop sign, and you will not see it. Humans will not see it, but the machine will not be able to see the stop sign anymore. It will interpret it in the wrong way. Or, for example, there's also a good use. If the machine, for example, you don't want self-driving cars to drive in your street, so what are you going to do? You're going to draw on your fence a child who's playing soccer or playing some, you know, just playing with a ball. And um, while well, the machine will not be able to tell a child just drawn on a fence from a real child and probably will never turn into your street because it'll be afraid of, you know, of, uh, creating an accident with that child. So this robustness problem, just a little, little deviation from the original data will not let the machine understand the situation correctly, interpret the situation correctly. That's, that, that's, quite a, that's quite a serious problem. Well, actually there are five types of these problems, but since I only have 10 minutes left, I'm not going to tell about all the five types of problems, robustness or learning without understanding, then there is bias, then there is a, something called specification problem and verification problem. I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to tell about solutions. 
In the last 10 minutes, the question will now be not what the problems are. We've heard enough about problems. What can we do with those problems? Can we solve them somehow? And let me show you one example. This is something that I hope you've all heard about called the trolley dilemma. Uh, it's a very old problem. Uh, if there's a trolley with brake, who's, you know, the brakes of this trolley just um, were broken and don't work anymore and it goes downhill and you cannot stop it. So will you direct it at that uh, path on the left where there's one person who will die or on the right where there are five people who will die and how are you going to decide? But of course, this, this applies directly to autonomous vehicles, to self-driving cars. Imagine a self-driving car cannot avoid an accident. How is it going to decide whether it's going to sacrifice a pedestrian or maybe a passenger? And what kind of pedestrian? A child, an old person, maybe a well-educated person? How is it going to decide on all that if it cannot avoid an accident? Of course, it better avoid accidents. But imagine it cannot avoid an accident. What will happen? So there are many, many different solutions. And it's, again, a problem of the metric. And people say, well, let's define something that the machine will be able to compute, that the car will compute. But how do you compute that? Do you take into account the age of the person who will be saved or the education level? Or maybe they're your friends on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, or maybe you're following them on TikTok or Instagram, and then they should be saved. But if you're not following them, then they should not be saved. And you see, I'm saying silly things. Just because all these different metrics, they're equal, they're, they're kind of monstrous. I mean, this is about life and death. We're not going to save somebody just because we're friends on Instagram. We 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 need a solution that is ethically acceptable. And in Germany, they created a whole governmental commission just to think about this problem. And the commission said, you cannot use a metric based on some predefined criteria. So you cannot use any sort of uh, discriminating criteria like age or education level or whether you're friends or not, right? So these self-driving cars are now in the United States of America, in Arizona, also in Pittsburgh. They're also in California, only in some areas, but in the entire state of Arizona, guys, you can, I was in Phoenix a couple of years ago, and I actually, I was driving uh, on, a, on a road, and then there was a car stopping next to me on a red light, and I looked at that car, and there was nobody at the wheel. So that does exist. What is the solution if that thing gets into an accident? And the German commission said, well, you cannot have a predefined solution. So some people at MIT in Boston and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology said, okay, let's do a poll. Let's ask people what they would have done if, if it were them in that situation. And that's a rather bad idea, putting a human where you have a machine, right? Humans and machines don't reason in the same way. Humans are responsible, machines are not responsible agents, they're not persons. But that poll showed that the world is kind of divided into three parts. So people in the Western world, they prefer inaction or sparing humans. People in Latin America and South America, they prefer to spare those who have the highest status in society. And people in Asia prefer to spare those who live according to the law, the lawful ones. And of course, it's sort of strange. It's a nice poll with about 2.3 million respondents. But when you are an engineer, can you implement this in computer code? And the answer is no. Because if you're creating an autonomous taxi, for example, a self-driving taxi, it's definitely not going to determine the citizenship of the next passenger and change its behavior according to their origin or citizenship, right? That's silly, you cannot do that when you're just creating a taxi. So if you're an engineer, that doesn't work. So we have to do something for this case. We have to have a metric. We cannot have a metric with some predefined parameters. We cannot just look at the use 
by humans. So what do we do? And here is a story. I will finish with that story. And that story has nothing to do with artificial intelligence at the first sight. So let me first tell you a story, and then I think you will understand why. Here is a story. It comes from one of the books of the Bible called the Book of Joshua. So one of these mythological books from many, many, many millennia ago, no modern technology at all. It tells you about the people of Israel who were crossing the desert from Egypt. You may have heard that story. And they arrived in the promised land and their, and their leader called Moses dies before they enter into the promised land. And then there is a new leader. They elect a new leader called Joshua. And with Joshua, they enter into the promised land, but the promised land is occupied and they have to wage war on those who already live there. But because this land had been promised to them by their God, they're kind of sure that they're going, they were going to win the war. All right, so they win the first battle and then suddenly they lose the second battle and Joshua doesn't get it. He does not understand why they lost the second battle. He tears his clothes and he falls before uh, the ark of the Lord and he speaks with his God and he says, God, I have an, an interpretability problem. Explain to me what happened. And God says, okay, I'm going to explain to you what happened. It's because somebody from your people of Israel had taken something that I, I had formerly forbidden to take. So somebody had broken my word. And of course, for this, I'm going, I, I was punishing and Joshua says, oh, now I get it. Thank you. That's an explanation of that uninterpretable fact. You see, I'm using the language of machine learning. And then Joshua continues, and that's the Talmud that, in, that, that tells us the story. Joshua goes on and he says, so God, tell me, who is that criminal? Who is that guy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put him to death and we will be again victorious. And God says, he asks Joshua, he asks in Aramean, the language of that uh, used in the Talmud is Aramean language. So it's not ancient Hebrew, it's Aramean. He says, uh, am I an informer? And the word for informer is really the Latin word delator, which means a really bad informer, somebody who we hate, who we don't like at all. Am I an informer, says God? Go and cast lots. And that's kind of strange. Why is that? Joshua does it. And then the person in whom this the lots show, he starts by saying, well, are you crazy? Are you deciding in a just way? Are you making justice by these lots, by random choice? And we, we can talk about this story later, but let me try to interpret the story. You should always interpret mythological stories, right? Because of course, they're not real stories. These are symbolic stories with symbolic meaning. Why was God saying this? Why didn't he not tell Joshua directly who was the criminal? Because of course, God in this myth knows who is the criminal, but does, he will not tell that, tell Joshua about that. Why is that? Because there is a conflict, right? There's a conflict situation there. And God knows that if only he had given that information, he would be judged as an informer, as a Latin word, delato, something really, somebody really bad, a bad guy who we hate. And God wants in the story to sort of subtract, to extract himself from that moral judgment, because the moral agents here are all human, but God is not a human agent. So this projection of morality on God doesn't make sense. There should be no projection. Uh, but how does God go about removing that projection of morality? Well, through randomness. And that's the role of chance for these non-human agents it removes the projection of morality. Now, you probably understand what my solution is for the trolley dilemma of autonomous vehicles, of self-driving cars, use chance. But now here's one example that you guys all know, I hope, and I will finish with this. This is called Google Smart Compose. Now, when you type something in Google, in, in the search engine or in Gmail, the system will 
automatically complete the phrase for you. We'll offer you in gray script, right? We'll offer you some continuation of your phrase. I think you all know that. And that's called the smart compose function. So what's the problem with smart compose? A couple of years ago, Google discovered that there was a huge problem. Many people wrote to Google saying, well, the personal pronouns, it gets them wrong. I want to write something saying she, and Google proposes to me to say he, or Google offers to me to say she when it should be he. And indeed, there are many words in our language, you know, things like words like engineer, right? An engineer is that he or she, it can be both. Uh, so sometimes the system will just make a mistake, will get it wrong. And many people in the year 2018 wrote to Google saying, well, this is a really serious moral problem, getting the personal pronouns wrong, getting the gender wrong. What did Google do? Google just removed these personal pronouns, the gendered personal pronouns, he and she, remove them all together from Smart Compose. You can try it. Smart Compose will never say he or she. Haven't heard about Pierre or haven't heard about Julia? How is she doing or how is he doing? Well, never. The, the, Google will tell you how is it going, right? This is neutral. This is not he or she. And by doing so, Google made the language of this natural language system of this chatbot a little more unhuman, right? Because we humans, we say he or she all the time. So imagine somebody who will be interacting a lot with a chatbot like this, maybe learning languages from this chatbot, learning new languages, never use the words he or she, that's bizarre. So my solution for that would be rather than just removing this, rather than you know, hiding your head in the sand and saying, well, 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 just, just remove that problem. I don't want to deal with it. Uh, remove the words and I have no problem. Rather than doing so, Google should have kept the personal pronouns in, but after some threshold of probable conflict, of probable ambiguity, choose the personal pronoun at random and inform the user that the pronoun, you know, with little, little text somewhere, very small script, inform the user that this pronoun had been chosen randomly. So that would have kept this language close to our language, human language, rather than making it unhuman, rather than, of course, forcing us to learn something not quite human through interaction, through the interaction with the system. How did we arrive at that conclusion? Where is this solution coming from? Not from the blue sky, right? We didn't just sit down and say, okay, what's the possible solution? We were trying to take this very new problem, right? Never before had we been able to build a chatbot not in the biblical times for sure, not even 20 years ago. The first chatbots from the 60s, 60s were really, really simple, but this problem didn't appear. That's a new problem. Do we need new ethics for the new problem? Well, I don't know what new ethics would be. I don't know such a thing. Where do we get new ethics? The technological context is new, but through this comparison with big narratives that are part of our culture, mythological narratives, movies, maybe stories from science fiction books about, let's say, Pygmalion or Frankenstein, if you know these stories. Through such a comparison, we can get an idea for a solution for this very new technological problem. And that is something that is so interesting because technology is new, but ethics cannot be new. So how do we find these analogies? How do we find these ideas from our culture, from our tradition in order to solve these new technological problems? That's the big question of AI ethics. 
And that's something that I was writing in my Russian book and in my French book. And unfortunately, that doesn't exist in English, at least yet, but maybe one day. So thank you all and ready to take some questions. Uh, thank you, Alexei. We actually got lots of questions in chat. Uh, Very good. Would, would you like to go to chat and answer them? Yeah, well, one? why don't you pick uh, up? Yeah, sure. yeah, you can read to me this some one by one because there are too many of them. So um, Sure, absolutely. Pick, I'll go to the beginning, some, right? Yes. And uh, let, let, let me choose some of the questions here. So if people can get attached to people, why cannot they get attached to robots? They can. That's a short answer. Of course they can. But the interesting thing is, even if they know it's a robot, they will still probably get it hatched. Because very often people who do computer ethics or lawyers will tell you, well, it's very important to explain to them that it's just a machine. Well, of course. They know it's a machine, they will still get attached to that machine. And that's a puzzle which is not so easy to solve because, well, normally if you know it's a machine, then you know it's really different from you, but you still project your emotions, your effects, your moral states on that machine. And through that projection, you can get attached to the machine. So it's a complex process, but of course you can. It's not forbidden, it's a fact. People get attached even to their smartphones, even to some apps on these smartphones. So it's something that we know pretty well. So and another question related to that, that if there is no physical body, for example, as a chatbot, what kinds of behaviors actually make us relate to a non-humanoid AI in a meaningful way? What is the attraction for those? Yes. So um, the chatbots uh, sometimes uh, have useful functions. For example, you know, you have insomnia, and the chatbot, you know, it doesn't sleep. It doesn't need to rest. It'll talk to you during the night. Sometimes the chatbots will just give you useful advice. Sometimes you feel lonely and the chatbot will always be there to keep company. Uh, sometimes there will be more than that. There will be manipulation from the chatbots. For example, the chatbot wants, or rather the designer of the chatbot wants you to buy some product. And the, you say, okay, I order pizza. And the chatbot will always order pizza from the place where you know, the designer probably gets some percentage or gets a good deal. So manipulation is also possible. All these different technologies um, are not um, ethically neutral by default. Uh, they can use emotional interaction, they can manipulate users, but we as sentient beings, when we use our language, of course, through language, we get attached because we cannot separate ourselves from language. We cannot you know, say that these are just words, they don't mean anything. Words do mean things for us. So, um, People who design chatbots, of course, know these things pretty well. And uh, there are situations in which it's really helpful and useful, like insomnia or psychological aid, or just keeping company with somebody who's lonely. But there are also other situations when it can go all the way to manipulation and to really nasty things. Another question was about face recognition. Does it always work or is it always learning? 
No, face recognition, of course, doesn't always work. Very few things always work. Uh, face recognition works today pretty well, uh, even if there is only part of the face that is open. But you can still uh, trick it into wrong behavior or just no recognition at all. Uh, for this, you probably need to know how those systems work. So you need to draw certain things on your skin. Uh, and then you can always, yeah, you can always induce strong results in that, in those kinds of systems. It's always possible. Can we design a chatbot that it will, in a way, so it will actually detect provocative and radicalizing messages and so they could be taken down before? Yes, that's the fun. goal. Yes, absolutely. That's the goal. It will probably not work 100%, but of course, that's what we're trying to do. And there is also an interesting question. So if somebody is insulting a chatbot, should, you, should the chatbot also insult the user in response or not? And I think you all say, no, 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 no. The chatbot should always be nice and kind to the user. Well, maybe, yeah, that's one ver one possible answer. There is another answer, which is the chatbot should just be like a mirror of its user. That's also possible. So that depends. And uh, I'm not sure that question was asked on the chat, but um, how about dead bots? Have you heard about dead bots? No. So the chatbots that imitate dead people, because of course the person is not there anymore but maybe there is enough data about that person, enough conversations, enough texts written by that person, different chats, all the personal data created by that person during their lifetime can be fed into a chatbot that will be speaking like that person, a kind of a digital double of that person. Microsoft recently, uh, uh, registered a patent for doing this. And also there are already some companies that offer small scale solutions like this. Um, a chatbot that speaks like a dead person, is that a problem? Because the person is not there anymore, but uh, maybe that person is still there in the form of a chatbot. Maybe that's a sort of new virtual life for that person. And that's a very new issue, very difficult to deal with. Is that good or bad? Are there limits? Can that chatbot speak in some new ways? Can it say really impossible things that the original person would have never, never said? Um, there are many, many questions here. So you see this technology breaks some new ground, really new. Normally, death is death. The person disappears, everything stops. And before this technology, well, so maybe somebody could write a book and say, I will live in my books. There is a great Roman poet, Horace, who lived in the first century BC, who wrote a fantastic poem that I think you all should know. Uh, I have erected a monument harder than bronze for me and I will live in the form of my poems, of my texts, even when I, my body will be gone, says Horace. And that poem, um, of course, is just speaking about Horace himself, somebody who wrote this great poetry that survived over centuries and centuries. And now imagine every single user of a smartphone will be able to create a digital double that will live after their death. There will be millions and millions of these virtual existences. What is the world going to look like in that case? Uh, nobody has an answer to that. It's an open question. We have never been there before, so we'll see. And would even those copies of humans have some rights in their own, right? Well, yeah, well, that's a, <laughs> in terms of rights, um, the question about rights is, is a difficult one, but uh, of course, so far rights um, are intrinsically associated with persons. So these systems are not persons. They could be, they, they can be autonomous. They can decide on their own. 
but that doesn't make them into persons. So I would say that it's important to distinguish uh, this sort of digital existences and persons. But of course, uh, you're also right, maybe we will evolve, maybe our um, laws will evolve, our norms of society will evolve, and maybe these things will start having rights sometime later. I personally don't think so, but we'll see. So Queen asks, what if AI ethics are completely different and have no value for humanity? And have no? No Sorry. value for humanity. No value so for humanity, right. Um, well, ethics by definition is something that is with human beings. There is no ethics in nature. It doesn't grow on trees. Um, nature is not ethical or unethical. It just has nothing to do with ethics. Ethics is a system of norms, of values, which has evolved in different cultures and civilizations, it belongs with human agents. That's why I said that other non-human agents like gods or angels or AI systems, they are not moral agents. They don't have ethics. But of course, they will change the way we humans live in the world, the way we are. Uh, I just said it will change even the concept of death. One of the deepest things about humans, death, it will change with AI technology. So AI ethics is not something uh, that can come from cosmos, you know, from outer space and uh, change our world. It's about how we are changing, how we humans are changing when we interact with these systems. Right? And the way we're changing is that, yes, there are some strange non-human types of behavior that I illustrated, conversations that don't make sense, um, very efficient, very precise results in, say, image recognition, but we don't know how that works. So it works, but it also changes us and it changes the way we are. And that's the, 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 the thing that we take into our world. We bring it into our world. And that's the change of ethics, right? So the machines themselves, they're not moral agents. They don't even know what is moral or ethical. They have no idea. They can, at most, they can manipulate these words, but they will not understand the meaning of these words. So the change it will be with us. And that's the deepest thing here. We will be bringing into our human world some features that did not belong there before, that came from the machines, but they will be human very soon. So the last question, and then we will wrap up. So does evolution select for ethical behaviors? Well, uh, a short question to that is I don't believe so, but of course it's debatable. There are people who say that yes. Um, evolution normally um, selects for the strongest, as you know, the fittest. Have you heard that phrase? The fittest. That's what Charles Darwin said. But the fittest, are they the most ethical ones? Well, not always. So that's why we have norms in society. We have laws and we have coercion systems like police, like the penitentiary system, prisons. We have uh, courts, all of these things that stop us from unlimited violence. So no, evolution otherwise would just choose for those, you know, select for those who are the strongest ones, maybe the most violent ones. But because we have norms, because we have all these different constraints, evolution, the evolution under constraints might possibly choose the most ethical ones, but only under constraints. And the question is, will those constraints be efficient? And that's a hard question. There 
from what I understand, there were actually different theories of how those things evolved. And we do help each other uh, so the group can survive and so on, even yes, sacrificing yeah. our own lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the best way to do that would be just to model that behavior. You know, that's that's the beauty of our computer technology today. We can model complex systems. So let's have a group of artificial agents who will be selfish and others who will be maybe more ethical, uh, more altruistic, and see how those artificial societies will evolve in time. And they will evolve, right? So the ones will not just uh, completely kill the other ones. Uh, there will be some interesting types of evolution. So let's model it. That's the point. We, rather than uh, trying to just guess it from human from human history, we can today actually model that behavior. That, that would be great to model uh, those complex societies and see whether ethics actually evolves over time. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was an amazing talk. I think you've learned a lot. Uh, lots of you know, thought-provoking discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you, and have a good afternoon, guys. So for me, it's late in the evening. It's still afternoon yes. for you. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes, I do disagree with some of uh, Dr. Greenbaum's thoughts, but this is something for us. This is such a new field, right? So we will discuss more. Goodbye. Absolutely, we'll have more webinars, of course. Goodbye. Okay.